Hello, everyone. Um, I am delighted to be talking to Phoebe Near this morning. Uh, she has been putting up very interesting videos on uh, the Shakespeare authorship issue. And I wanted to find out where we would be going in the future with those. So, Phoebe, thanks for joining us. And uh, where are we going? <laughs> oh, and I, this is my cat, Basil. So. It's so great. Um, where are we going? So, you know, for the past... I've been kind of trying to move fast and break things and work on a couple of different fronts. Um, it felt like there was a real pressing need to create content that was introductory level um, because, you know, there's so much wonderful high level scholarship out there. But I think people or at least myself, honestly, like, you know, it, there was a, a, a gap um, that needed to be filled in. So I, I try to do it on TikTok. I've been making some YouTube videos as well. Um, I also think that um, there is an opportunity, which I've been trying to, you know, capitalize on of making this something that really is resonating with young people as like a cool trend, um, which I think it is and it should be. Um, and I, I've been, that I think has been really encouraging almost more than anything else. Um, of what I've been working on it is people seem really curious and enthusiastic and wanting to learn more. Um, so that's been part of like live events that I've been putting on. Um, and in terms of what's next, you know, I really do think at this point, um, it has to be kind of a top down approach. I don't think that the way to convince the world, sorry, there's like some truck backing up probably for the next 20 minutes. I don't guess. hear it. OK, um, I think that it, in terms of the top down approach, I don't think at least in terms of who who I'm trying to reach or how I'm conceiving of things, although, you know, grain of salt, as usual, um, having it just be like YouTube videos or even books that are targeting history nerds, people who are already history nerds and then convincing the history nerds one by one through like deep argument, that's something that's worth doing and it's important, but I don't think that that's ultimately what moves the needle. Like what we're looking is to like revolutionize, you know, you know, we're looking to topple, you know, a multi-billion dollar tourist industry. We're looking to disrupt, um, you know, entrenched academia, you know, institutions. And so I think that something like a TV show, something like, you know, prestige media write-ups about this, think pieces, profiles, like these are the types of things that I think have to come to sort of be what tips the first domino. And then the incredible scholarship and intellectual resources that are in place are there once people are starting to seeking them out. Of course, um, uh, uh, as trendy uh, as the the idea of uh, moving fast and breaking things is I don't know why I've heard that before. Um, but is it like a tech thing? Is it like Steve Jobs, maybe, or something? Yeah, I, uh, it's vague. But um, you are not being nihilistic. You're not saying we're going to break this down and then we're going to leave. Um, you are, in effect, proposing we're going to break down what is false um, and help you understand what's true. Um, and Am I right on that? Totally. Let me quickly Google <laughs> move fast and break. Yeah. Oh, it's Mark Zuckerberg. Oh, my God. I just quoted Mark Zuckerberg. Unless you are breaking stuff, you are not moving fast enough. OK, so I guess this was this was spoken by the founder of Facebook, I guess, in his approach to disrupting. Well, I don't know. I, I didn't know who I was quoting. <laughs> When I oh, it's important to, to do that. But, I guess but let's so. I just okay, heard so somebody let's, say let's, it recently. But I think that it's I, I guess honestly, I, I think I should lean into it because I do think that the I I think in terms of at least um no, yeah, I, I think it's I think it's appropriate. I, I would say, yeah, let's move fast, let's break things. That's my approach. Right. So in that case, um, having uh, uh, viewed um, all of your videos for um, Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship and and others, um, what's next? I mean, how do you accomplish that goal that you're setting of kind of setting up a, a second paradigm, one that is actually based in reality um, and not in the fantasy of uh, an illiterate man from illiterate parents with illiterate children uh, writing the world's greatest masterpieces. 
give us a sense of where you might, maybe not, but might be going next. So, you know, I've been obviously reflecting a lot on how to communicate around this stuff, how to talk to young people about it, how to talk to normal people about it, what makes people care. And I think what I keep coming up against is like, even in terms of using these technologies, you know, people can smell immediately like Zoomers, like, you know, can immediately smell, even for me, if I'm not like a digital native and I don't know how to use TikTok properly, or I don't know, you know, or I'm not familiar with the conventional formats of YouTube or something, people can Im immediately smell it on you. And I think what it comes down to is like p the way that young people or different generations interact with technology is really fundamentally how they interact with the world, the the challenges that they feel that they're facing. So when they're mistrustful of a misuse of these types of technologies, are you showing up and not knowing, you know, the language? It's actually their right to be suspicious because I think what they're picking up on fundamentally is this idea that you're not connecting with their basic reality. And so what I've been trying to do in storytelling is to really understand where is this going to resonate with people today? And the good news is I think it's hugely resonant. Um, you know, it's funny. I remember once you and I had a conversation, maybe it was our last interview where you were talking about kind of unfairness and which I thought was interesting because I think that uh, I think unfairness or the unfairness of the attribution or the credit, I, maybe that could be a your gen, like that could be coded as like a boomer thing, potentially, you know what I mean? In terms of that texture of that emotional experience or like kind of wanting to like level the playing field. I think for my generation. And again, I'm not even sure if I can speak to Zoomers or what they're going through. And I thought your your son's YouTube uh, thing was awesome. I loved it. I hope there's Thank more coming. You. Fantastic. I hope seriously, the Shakespeare Austin Fellowship should hire him to make like 70 of those. Like, I'll pass that along. They should. <laughs> High recommendation. They should. Um, but I think the fact that even just like the, the similarities between um, writing under a pseudonym and internet culture today and Twitter and Reddit and shit posting as it's referred to, it's it's an obvious parallel and it's, it's something that immediately raises people's interests because most young people who are, you know, kind of interested in the internet, they know what it's like to operate in an environment that's, uh, you know, full of pseudonyms. And they understand what's pressuring and motivating people to speak under pseudonyms and that there is pressure to maybe, you know, dial back your opinions or to have some sort of like split identity. Even, for example, like Satoshi Nakamoto as a figure, people kind of understand. Um, a new name to me. Who is oh, Satoshi Nakamoto is the pseudonym of the creator of Bitcoin. Ah, Mm -hmm. And it's actually really interesting. Um, a friend of mine who's like a cypherpunk was telling me that I, I'd heard this vaguely, but he was he was really interested in the comparison between Satoshi Nakamoto and William Shakespeare in that part of why um, the person who created Bitcoin wanted to be anonymous is I think, A, like you have all these other coins in Ethereum, but they have founders or, you know, even Mark Zuckerberg, our, our friend who's, you know, brought in front of Congress and yelled at. And, you know, the fact is no one knows who Satoshi Nakamoto is and that's on purpose. And also I think there is in Japan, somebody named Satoshi Nakamoto who was like vaguely adjacent to the tech industry and people showed up at his house and reporters were trying to interview him and he was totally confused as to what was going on. And it really took a while because of it being like his alonym um, people at first were like, no, it's got to be this guy. He's, you know, vaguely adjacent to the tech industry. But then people kind of dug deeper and realized, no, this somehow um, the person who coded it must have known about this guy or known this guy and thought it was funny to use his name. But like this guy clearly doesn't have the qualifications, can't have done it. And there's also a meme that floats around from time to time uh, about Satoshi Nakamoto. And there's it shows how Satoshi Nakamoto breaks down potentially into four different types of cell phones from a bunch of years ago. So it's like Samsung, Toshiba, um, Motorola, and whatever. And so that to me really correlates even this idea of William Shakespeare as something that's, you know, a pseudonym, an alonym, a sort of sexual innuendo style childish joke and a more high-minded, you know, literary uh, illusion. So I think that that's the kind of stuff I think people immediately can contextualize and understand. Um, so for me, in terms of framing it, I don't even start with 
the absurdity of how can this guy because in that I think I think if I start off and saying how can you think that this guy who doesn't even know how to read and this and that they get defensive or something or it feels like I'm making an accusation really? whereas if I start and say okay you know imagine a world in which um you know people feel that there is a lot of political censorship that there's civil unrest that there's a succession crisis going on in the government that somebody is speaking out about who the government and making critiques and um you know that you can literally be put in prison for um writing history or writing satire which are illegal leading up to you know yeah. um, like the like the, like kind of if you this is for me there's two stories of the elizabethan period that were given and one of them is a fake propaganda story you know so this idea that it's this happy wonderful proto hollywood and shakespeare and ben johnson are competing with one another to write hits and they're like trying to write these hit plays and everyone's having a wonderful time at the playhouses that to me is like this like disneyland fake story and if you say that's actually if you go beneath it here's the reality of it it was you know writers were having their hands cut off it was illegal to write history it was you know treason to question who the next monarch was going to be and the reason that common people are flocking to the playhouse is it isn't because they just they're having so much fun. It's because it's the only place that they can go to try and understand what's going on in the political situation that's that's governing their lives. And so the and, deep <laughs> allegories have to be employed. And so it's smart people, but you have to learn how to read beneath the surface. And, and, so and about, yeah, literally those people flocking to the theaters could not read words. Mm -hmm. uh, so to for them to read beneath the surface, they had to see it on the stage. Yeah. And then they could figure it out based on sort of common knowledge and gossip and and bad jokes and things like that. But um, yeah. uh, I, I think I always think that's an important point to remember um, in terms of trying to understand Shakespeare. The audience, by and large, by and large, uh, was not literate. Now, there were some plays written uh, for for court for nobility, and they were literate. They was uh, were as literate as Oxford was. Um, yeah. Uh, but uh um we can't really transpose our knowledge and our uh, environment uh 400 years back on the elizabethans um and say well they just put their iphones down you know turn the television off and went to the theater no that's not how it happened the theater was the principal uh means of communication um, right. There's there's a lot of um, uh, activity now, uh, given the year in the first folio. Yeah. Uh, 400 400th year anniversary of its publication. Do you have any plans to take a structured look at the first folio? Um. I'm talking like an editor here. So just just a kind structured of go look. Along. I'm sorry. I'm like, do you mean like to read it? I'm like, I'm <laughs> no. I'm. No. Okay. What can you define structured look? Uh, take a look uh, in your style of of. Um, oh, you uh, mean like to create uh, YouTube videos around it? Yeah. Well, so you know, unfortunately, I don't look. This, this is, and again, I don't want to. I I don't have a. I have. I've only been granted funding for two more videos which is unfortunate because I think the difference, and again, this is getting to this, the specific nuances of these things mm -hmm. like TikTok is about going viral. TikTok's about having like one hit video, whereas YouTube is really about like slow momentum. And, and slow building growth. up an audience. And yeah. building up an audience. And so unfortunately I haven't been given funding to do a lot more videos. I have two left, which is a disappointment, which is why I said they should give your sons like 70 videos. And just really <laughs> no, I mean, it. it's like, it sounds funny, but like, that would make a difference. It sounds like funny that would to actually, me. And, yeah, and, I mean, he's a he's a lingua he's a, a, a linguistics major, and he's graduating. Um, this could be a secondary career, but um, you know, but we'll leave that to him. But let me focus on you and just point out, not that I'm in the decision making capacity, but you know, funding comes in, funding goes out. It's got to come in first, and we're always looking for mechanisms to do that. Um, uh, I, I just think the, if, if you can find an interesting angle to the first folio, I think that might make, I'm not pushing this on you, but that might make an interesting, um, uh, a story for your, uh, style of filmmaking. Um, let me switch gears and ask about your, uh, parties, uh, in New yeah. York. 
Uh, you've, yeah. uh, uh, um, uh, I think you've had one or two, or you've done one and you have a second coming up. Um, um, I've done two. Okay. There was you, one last August and then one this January. Okay. Do you see more of those? Um, so just to circle back to what you were last saying in terms of the first folio, um, which I think there's, you know, obviously is an endlessly fascinating um, document. I, I think for me, what I've been trying to focus on more than even the folio is Edward Devere as a person, because I think that people don't, there's no real, we don't know an author. Like, yeah, I think when I say we don't, don't really know who the author is of Shakespeare's plays, you know, Will, William Schoenbaum said, who's a Shepherdian biographer, said that, you know, what we know about him could fit on a postage, you know, a postcard with room for the address. So right. you know, it's a Satoshi Nakamoto person. It's an invisible man. And so I think for me, in a lot of ways, the most compelling story to tell is of this guy, Edward Devere. Okay. And I've been intentionally using Devere instead of Oxford, because I think that it's like kind of from an SEO standpoint, it's more accessible for people to understand a person named Edward Devere versus, you know, even like we talk about Harry and Meghan on the tabloids, but no one ever refers to them as like the Sussexes. So I think it's a more sort of like accessible way of, of talking about a human being. So I think the more mm -hmm. that we can kind of give flesh and blood and personality to Edward Devere, the more sort of weak and feeble the Stratfordian narrative is going to be. So for me, more so than even going into, and I love, for me personally, I, I love going into the deepest of dives in the first folio. Well, you can tell, you can tell, yeah. I mean, in terms of communicating with, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. In terms of communicating with broader audiences or young people, I think it's really got to be who's this guy and why do we think okay. this guy matters? Because um, that's more interesting to people than a book, I think. Or you have to care about the guy to understand what the context or the implications of the book are. Very interesting. Um, in and, and, of, and I think you're right. I mean, I do. Thanks. <laughs> in terms of the parties, um, you know, um, I am the next event that I have planned, which is coming up in a couple of weeks, is going to be so is going to be like another kind of social gathering, but it's going to be like um, a reading of like a play, a short play, like a closet drama style play about Edward Devere oh, that cool. I wrote to sort of be a, a jumping off point for discussion about who this person is and, and kind of, you know, imagining his life and times. Um, so I've been trying to build up a social community around Oxfordianism with people that are like, you know, kind of artistic or interested in these sorts of things. And I think it's going well. And I think where it's resonating for people, I think of my generation is it feels like, honestly, like the heroes are, are you guys like the, the skull, like for, I think a lot of people of my generation, a major theme, like, just like you were talking about, like unfairness is a major theme for me. I think one of the major themes of our lives is this sort of disillusionment with institutions and how a lot of these institutions aren't functioning anymore, or it felt like they were working for our parents' generations, but they're not working today. And so I think that the story of the fact that there is the most extraordinary, inspiring community of uh, academics happening, and it's outside of the traditional academy, and the academy is just wrong, like straight up just wrong. Yeah. Um, that really resonates with people. Like that is people like that. People get it. It it uh, is consistent with their experiences of navigating, you know, the the workforce and and life in general. And so I think that that's there's, really there's really, there's discussion going on. Uh, in academia, academia these days, about the fall off in students uh, at the undergraduate level who mm -hmm. are enrolling in mm -hmm. liberal arts literature classes. Um, one of the uh, blame game issues is well, it's because we have all this money being put into STEM um, uh, education, uh, science, technology education and something else engineering uh, and medicine yeah i'll buy it it's stem um big stem fans out here i guess <laughs> maybe that's right and maybe that's an issue but i don't think it's the real thing i think uh something has got to be a part of that is that at least within shakespeare if you get through memorizing the plays and learning the layers of academic discussion that have 
piled on in the years, it's kind of boring if you're really not into it. Um, and the excitement of Shakespeare um, uh, is missed if your focus is on um, uh, knowing what was said in the 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. Um, so I think that uh, uh, a true reading of the Oxford plays, of the Shakespeare plays, can really stimulate academic discussion. I'm with you. You know, absolutely. So um, it can bring, I really think it's like, I really feel like it can bring them back to life. Like for me, for me, the fundamental issue that I see is that, you know, because some people will say, oh, you know, is it controversial to say, you know, do people think it's classist when you say an Earl wrote it? And I was like, people don't care at all. People my age don't care about Shakespeare. They read it in once in school and it was like they didn't get it and it's over. Like no one cares. And that's the, the biggest tragedy of them all is I'm like, really? this body of work can save us. Like truly, like this is like, like for me, I fell back in love with Shakespeare after becoming an Oxfordian and it changed my life. And it's given me this energy and this that's enthusiasm, great. which has yeah. sustained me. It's like, it's like, it saved me. Like it gave me direction and purpose. Like I I'm so grateful that I discovered Oxfordianism and the work that, you know, this academic community is, is putting out. And I think that even like, um, it's the difference between like, think about the sonnets, think about what Stratfordianism, the, 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 the cry and shame people think of the sonnets, like maybe people know, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? And it's like some, you know, it's in the, it's in the drugstore aisle with the Valentine's day cards and <laughs> who could care less, you know what I mean? Like, versus you see the work that like, you know, Hank Whittemore's, you know, the work that's being done about the sonnets and the first yeah. folio, whereas people think of it as something that's not even worth their, their time. And so I think that, it gives you a jolt of electricity when you understand, oh, wow, it was just like today. They weren't, it was like, cause it's like, even just like sometimes like the fairy tale quality of, of the Shakespeare's plays are, can feel a little like sing-songy or childish. And it's like, no, these were intense political allegories. People weren't, it's like, and you're like, oh, were people in the Elizabethan period, they just wanted to watch stuff about like fairies, like, you know, princes and no, it's like, you know, the, the extended allegory of the caskets in Merchant yeah, of Venice. Yeah. It's like, it's like, it's like watching a presidential debate. You know what I mean? It's like right. people were engaged in it. And so people nowadays know what it's like to watch presidential debates. People nowadays know that, you know, so they, I just think there's, I think people will love it when they start to realize what it is that they're missing out on. So um, if you were to take your New York style happenings, gatherings, I don't know what the, I haven't lived in New York in a long time, so I'm not hip on the, on the dialogue, but if you were to take that model and move it to say, downtown Chicago, near the Loop, or near one of the uh, schools, you think it could translate? Um, yes, I do think it can translate. Um, I, I think what I've been doing has been very grassroots. Um, I've been basically, I'm kind of a part of a creative community. And so I've been focusing on, you know, I was thinking to myself, like, okay, the last big wave of, you know, Shakespeare authorship discourse was really like, you know, in the latter half of the 19th century, where you're talking about Walt Whitman and Ralph Waldo Emerson and Helen Keller and Mark Twain. And I was like, well, what did they, what, 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 what made that work? And I was like, well, they were all writing letters. It was a bunch of like influential creative people and they were all in conversation mm -hmm. together. And so for mm -hmm. me, I was like, I'm going to start small. Or I also thought to myself, like, okay, you know, you go to like urban outfitters and there's like a Nirvana t-shirt at urban outfitters. Now it's the most commercial possible thing, but you still wear it and it still looks like kind of a cool, oh, Nirvana. Like it still has this like edge of something punk. How did that shirt get there? And I was like, well, it started in like a garage in like Olympia, Washington. <laughs> and most people thought it was weird and didn't get it. But yeah. then some people who were like kind of cool, they got it. And then from that weird garage scene in Olympia, Washington, it ends up at Urban Outfitters and everybody knows about it. So I'm like, that's what I love. That's what I would love to see, like the rebrand of like, you know, the new Shakespeare, which mm -hmm. is like mm -hmm. something that everybody should be able to participate in, in the most mass commercial way possible, just because we need to get it out in front of everyone. But it also feels a little bit punk and cool. And so I was like, OK, I have access to a creative community in New York that is intellectually curious, that is open minded and challenges conventional, you know, conventionally held beliefs that has some 
kind of celebrity figures that get a disproportionate amount of press attention to how accessible they are for me to invite them to the party. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I was like, that's my starting place. So, and it worked, you know, from there, like that downstream of that, I, you know, and I don't want to take all credit or whatever, because it's obviously, but like, you know, a month later was the New Yorker cartoon, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. So, so I was like, this is working. Like I'm finding a way to get in front of people who are media influencers, you know, on their radars. So I, it worked. So I was like, New York is high level. It's a high leverage discourse community that's small and accessible. And I can like saturate it with this message. So in terms of where I would take it next, I think I need to have real local knowledge and know who are the cool influencers in that community who are the right people to target because it's more fun for people to go to a gala when they feel like they're going to see and be seen and they know who else yeah. is showing up. Like it really has been trying to cultivate like a scene, not just like something that you buy tickets to like an audience member. So okay. like I'm planning to move to San Francisco, honestly, um, oh, really? in the fall, I think that's my next move. And so I would do, I have sort of rumblings of what it would look like to do it there and honestly, I think there would be a lot of enthusiasm there, even just from like the tech community and people who are very online, people who frankly have like money and are interested in, in like, I think would be interested in, in participating. It's not as oversaturated a cultural market. So I see potentially like a San Francisco Devere ball next, but that would be a little bit down the line. But I am planning on hosting like a series of smaller events, like, you know, the one I just mentioned, which is, um, you know, coming up at the end of this month. Um, you know, Elizabeth Winkler is going to do some kind of book tour. So yeah. I'll maybe do something with her if that works out. Um, Bob Prechter is, is coming into town for like an economics conference. I might do like a meet and greet with him. Um, you know, the way that I've been throwing these events, frankly, is, you know, I lure people in by saying they're going to go to a glamorous party and meet internet celebrities. And then I sort of throw in the Oxfordianism. So it's trying to get that balance right. All and right. Um, Yeah. Sounds like you'll be busy. Um, I've got some other thoughts on some of these things, and I'll uh, send you a separate email on them. But um, keep up the good work. Keep in touch. Um, Thank you. And uh, talk to you soon. Look forward to the next video. Thank you. Right, <laughs> Have a take great day. care. Bye-bye.